a rapidly expanding imperialist nation state, an insular, xenophobic, post-apocalyptic techno cult, a decades-long military clash that devastated the survivors of the American Southwest. This is what occurs when strict dogmatic principles and practices collide with stubborn, overexpansive, and uncompromising doctrine. My dear Wastelanders, I present you the NCR Brotherhood War. For the better part of a century, the Brotherhood of Steel and settlers of California maintained a relative peace, even assisting one another with regional conflicts wherever their ideals aligned. From skirmishes with an army of hostile super mutants to collisions with the technologically superior enclave, the combined might of these two factions was unparalleled, a might which quickly led to their dominance over all of California. However, as with all things, this peaceful coexistence was bound to end. An end, it did. In the years following the destruction of the Enclave oil rig and subsequent sacking of the Enclave's main operating land base, Navarro, the New California Republic were able to secure a wealth of advanced technology. Seeing this, in addition to the Republic's push into imperialism following the death of President Tandy, the Brotherhood of Steel became anxious, anxious that the NCR was following in the steps of the pre-war U.S. government. It wasn't long after the Brotherhood's Elder Council decided that the growing nation around them were a true threat that any action was taken. The Brotherhood adopted a reactionary policy in response, proceeding to limit the flow of, and in some cases outright seize, any pre-war advanced technologies in the region. These actions caused a significant amount of pushback from their neighboring wastelanders, especially in regards to energy weapons, as many energy weapons owned by the common wastelander were either trophies of war or family heirlooms passed down from generation to generation since before the Great War. With an outraged populace, it would only be a matter of time before the new California clapped back. By this point, the NCR had long outgrown their humble origins in Shady Sands. With the combined power of the Boneyard, Dayglow, Maxon, and the Hub, in addition to their capital, as well as an entire military sharpened in their wars against both the Unity and Enclave, the Republic had become a true force to be reckoned with. Refusing to be pushed around by the likes of the Brotherhood, the NCR pushed back against them with their full might, setting in motion a series of events that would lead to the longest and bloodiest war the nation had yet to experience. Skirmishes broke out immediately between the two factions. The better trained and equipped Brotherhood forces were able to mop up the NCR resistance with little difficulty, quickly taking many key objectives in the war while dealing crippling blows to the Republic. While this one-sided cleanup operation continued for the first few years of the war, eventually the scales would rebalance in favor of the NCR. Due to their insular nature, the Brotherhood of Steel refuses to recruit members from outside their own society, a factor that would prove detrimental to their war efforts. While their tactics and technology were far superior than that of the Republic, each and every member of their order is invaluable meaning that the replacement of battlefield casualties would take years. Years that the Brotherhood didn't have. In order to meet the manpower requirements of the war, many knights and paladins were promoted from lesser ranks who lacked the expertise necessary to properly fill that role. Not only were the overall Brotherhood forces dwindling due to a lack of recruitment, but the effectiveness of their military was also diluting leading to a perpetuating cycle which resulted in a stark increase of battlefield casualties. The NCR, on the other hand, took a note out of ancient Rome's playbook and reinforced their positions constantly throughout the war, utilizing mass recruitment and conscription to their advantage. Like Scipio versus Hannibal before them, it wouldn't matter how many casualties the Brotherhood inflicted on the NCR, as there was always a body to replace them. While the tier of soldier is much lower with this maneuver, all they needed for victory were more bodies with barrels pointed in the right direction. The Republic eventually came out on top through attrition, pushing the Brotherhood back and into the safety of their bunkers. While the tide may have turned in favor of the NCR, the Brotherhood refused to be defeated, proceeding to launch guerrilla operations against the Republic in an attempt to collapse them from within. These operations proved highly effective against their foe, and in a series of raids on the NCR's gold reserves, the Brotherhood managed to either steal, destroy, or otherwise render useless the vast majority of gold in Republic territory. 
As news of these attacks reached the various settlements within the region, citizens of the NCR began to panic and rushed to exchange as many of their dollars for what little gold remained. Once the remaining reserves had emptied out, the NCR dollar had become largely useless. The Republic, desperate to keep their economy afloat, countered this by enacting a new fiat currency. While this new tactic was successful in stabilizing economic proceedings in their core territory, a vast amount of damage had been done to their reputation and the common people's faith in their dollar. Wastelanders quickly came to distrust the stability of the NCR currency, especially those living out on the frontier. While this profound distrust made the stabilization of their economy an uphill battle, for some, it paved the way for opportunity. With the NCR's economy quickly caving in around them, Merchant consortiums of the hub seized the opportunity and re-established their own currency to replace the Republic dollar, ye olde bottle cap. Tried, true, and backed by a standard measure of water, the bottle cap made a triumphant return to the wasteland. Due to its position in southeastern California bordering Nevada, the hub became an economic buffer zone between California and the recently annexed lands of the Mojave Wastes. With the economic crisis relatively resolved, and with significant casualties on both sides, the NCR Brotherhood War had stalemated, and it would stay this way for decades, with mass-scale skirmishes occurring well into the 2270s. This fragile balance of power would soon shift in the NCR's favor, with the location of and subsequent assaults on several Brotherhood bunkers. Using their superior numbers and tactical flexibility, the NCR was able to push deep into these bunkers, either destroying them outright or forcing the Brotherhood to self-destruct them in order to prevent them from falling into the NCR's hands. With six Brotherhood bunkers completely wiped out and the Brotherhood in retreat, tensions in California were beginning to die down. Meanwhile, tensions in the Mojave were just now coming to a head. Originally established sometime in the 2260s, the Mojave chapter of the Brotherhood of Steel had operated uncontested in the region for years, under the controversial leadership of Elder Elijah. Upon rediscovering the Helios-1 solar power plant, Elijah made the executive decision to move the chapter's headquarters from the safety of the Hidden Valley bunker system to the power plant, against the objections of nearly every paladin within the Order. The indefensible nature of the solar power plant painted a massive target on the Mojave chapter of the Brotherhood of Steel. A detail that would not go unnoticed by the NCR. Upon expanding into the region, including the occupation of Hoover Dam and McCarran Airport, the NCR now had a sizable enough force to challenge the Mojave Brotherhood for control of the region, and would proceed to launch a series of attacks on the power plant. Despite Helios 1's poor defensibility, the chapter was able to put up a staunch defense against these NCR raids. For two years, the Brotherhood and NCR had stalemated in the Mojave, maintaining the fragile balance of power between them. But this would all change when the NCR launched Operation Sunburst, a mass-scale military offensive on the entrenched Brotherhood chapter. With forces equating between 15 and 20 to 1, the Republic's army would surround the solar power plant in an endless barrage of fire. The Brotherhood forces defended the plant valiantly, but were eventually worn down. After sustaining heavy casualties, with their elder having disappeared without a trace, the Brotherhood was forced into retreat, vacating their position at Helios 1, and falling back through the mountain pass to the Hidden Valley Bunker System, where they would initiate a strict lockdown to prevent detection by the NCR. With Brotherhood chapters having been forced into hiding all around the American Southwest, the NCR shifted their focus to the new war they had found themselves embroiled in, the war against Kaisar's Legion. The Republic would soon pull many veterans of the Brotherhood War to meet this new threat on the Eastern Front, allowing for a brief reprieve for the surviving Brotherhood chapters, a chance to breathe, collect themselves, and regroup. As of 2281, skirmishes still occur between the Brotherhood and the NCR out west. However, most chapters are too small and diluted to be of any real threat. While the Republic largely considers this war to have been won, it officially is still ongoing. Only time will tell what the future holds for these armor-clad knights of the post-apocalypse, be it survival or decimation. Perhaps a change in doctrine, change in leadership, 
or reinforcements from the growing Brotherhood chapter out east will be enough to shift the balance of power in their favor once again. <laughs>